Yeah. It works. Uh, so what I want to do, I want to explain a bit the search for safe havens in the Netherlands. So what we are doing, uh, what I want to do, I want to introduce myself briefly, then explain why a safe haven is needed, and then this search. So it's interesting, it's an interesting example, and I think you can learn also from this example in other countries. So in the past, so I studied business administration in Tilburg, and then I worked in banking for five or six years at ING Bank. And then the financial crisis hit ING, and uh, to my surprise, most of my colleagues couldn't explain what was happening. And then I started to research the system myself, and today now three of the things that I'm doing currently, so I'm finishing my PhD research into the design of the monetary finance system in a digital age. This is at Del Delft University, and recently, half a year ago, I became professor of new finance, and that's a good thing, so I don't have to be involved in neoclassical things. I'm allowed to think about new things, so that's a good thing to, uh, for me. And I'm chairman since a couple of more, since a half year or a bit more of Foundation Onsgeld, the sister organization of Positiva Pengar. And I'm involved since the beginning at Onsgeld. And so why a safe haven is needed? It fits really well to the presentation of Mr. Ordonez. So why it is needed? So the current monetary system is by design unstable. So this is the first problem and it leads to a second problem. That's, that is what I call in my PhD thesis a vicious cycle of an increasing amount of increasingly complex regulation. These are the two problems I want to tackle, or we, we aim to tackle. And what I define as the root cause of both problems is contractual liquidity. So contractual, contractual liquidity is to, uh, the obligation uh, to exchange on demand at par one form of money into another form of money. And what makes my PhD, but also the Onsgeld approach, I think quite unique, is that we focus on digitalization. So that's a key element. So I argue in my thesis, so digitalization worsens both problems, the instability of the current monetary system and the complexity of regulation. So we should use also digital technologies to solve the bo both problems. So what we did in the Netherlands, so we established, uh, established Onsgeld in 2012. And in 2015, we had a citizens initiative and we worked there together with a theater group. So they, they are called the Verleiders, the seducers, and they are quite famous in, in the Netherlands and they made a show taken by the bank. And about 140,000 Dutch citizens went to this show. So they explained money creation, they explained the problems of the current system and also discussed, discussed banking scandals. And in a way, we use a kind of techni te technical language, but they, of course, are allowed to have a much more easier, accessible uh, language. So we did the citizens' initiatives, and we wanted to put the public-private entanglement in a monetary financial system on a political uh, agenda. So this is really key. This is what we try to do. And we had three radical or structural proposals we want to put on the parliament, in a, uh, uh, we want to have discussed in the parliament. The first is public money creation. The second, the development and introduction of digital cash, so digital inherent liquidity, I call it in my thesis. And the third one, the liberalization of the credit system, of the banking system, quite in line with Ordonez. So we launched in January 2015, primetime Dutch television in this talk show. These are the theater makers or the theater players. They launched the Citizens Initiative, and in the Netherlands, if you gather 40,000 signatures, the parliament has to debate the, the topic. And within one, way, one day, we had enough uh, signatures, and in, in total, we had 110 or 112,000 signatures. So the parliament had to debate this issue. It was on a political agenda. And what they did the first time, so the finance committee of the, of the lower house, they organized a round table uh, discussion, an expert meeting on the topic, and we were invited as well. I'm sitting there, and this is the, the famous theater player. So he explained the problem to the politicians and we were allowed to give more technical comments. And also a lot of bankers and economists were invited. And at that time it was uh, like a conceptual mess. So there was a general misunderstanding how the system worked and what we want to address. But in a way, but, but in a way there was attention for the topic, so it was interesting and we were, uh, yeah, we were invited, so it was interesting and a good conversation. Then afterwards, so it, at the same time, so a, a guy in the Netherlands, he has the same name as my, uh, as my uh, Richard van der Linde, an entrepreneur, he was interested in the topic. And what he said, so I, 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 I found a foundation, a foundation full reserve, and what I tried to do, I tried to establish a non-profit private deposit bank. A quite clever idea. And in combination with a proposal to gradually abolish deposit insurance schemes, so de deposit guarantee schemes, the, the opium of the current system. 
So he proposed this and we met him and it was a good collaboration. So we decided to collaborate. And then we asked people now, so do, do you want to become a founding member of this bank? So we found 2,400 people who want to invest in this bank. We had a lot of meetings with politicians, central banker and the Ministry of Finance, but there were all the time legal obstacles. And the main problem was, so even if you have a deficit bank, so there's no credit risk at all, you have to be part of the deficit insurance schemes. So you are also responsible for the, for the risk that other banks take. So this was a big problem and yeah, we met them all, but the problem was not solved. Then in March 2016, there was a debate in the lower house on our proposal and there were two main outcomes. So the lower house, all members of the lower house voted in favor of a safe haven for book money, all of them. And they asked the, the finance minister to find out how it could be implemented. Then the second thing, the lower, uh, uh, the lower asked the Netherlands Scientific Council for Government Policy to research our proposal, the current system and alternatives. So this is what happened. Then of course it took a while and uh, we were lucky in the Netherlands, so we organized quite often large conferences and in October uh, 2016, Kumhoff came to Delft University where I uh, do my PhD. So this, uh, th then the publication came, the macroeconomics of central bank issued digital currency, so that's for Ryan two, or three. We, we also add this, we could add to our uh, variants. So we organized this large conference and since then, central bank digital currency is also a topic in the Netherlands. So it became even a hot topic, I would say. Then, because it took that long time, so there was still no private deposit, deposit bank and also the Dutch Scientific Research Council didn't publish their report. And there was a member of the Socialist Party he submitted a new proposal to, to, the, to, to the parliament and he wanted to establish a public de deficit bank and he titled it 100% safe saving and paying. So this was a new initiative and also here the parliament or the government has to react on. So he, it took that, the, that long time that this member of parliament said then I take responsibility and try to change the system. Still not implemented. Then in January last uh, uh, this year, the, public, the, the report Money and Debt of the Dutch Scientific Research Council was finally published. So this is the fina finance min minister and the, the, the main researcher, and he's a professor at Erasmus University. And this report uh, yeah, gives a historical des description of the current system, it analyzes the main problems, it's much in line with uh, what mon monetary, monetary reforms argue, but it does not recommend a change of the system because of transition risks just mentioned by Ordonez, but we should careful design transition path. But what they argued, so they argue reform is a dangerous experiment, we should not do it. But a safe haven is needed. And their argument, I think it's really fundamental, it's really interesting. So what, for instance, the Bank of International Settlements argues that the main risk of a central bank digital currency is that you allow or make it easier to have a digital bank run. But the Netherlands Scientific uh, Council for Government Pol Policy thinks differently. So what they argue, they argue we reverse the reasoning, creating a safe alternative can actually contribute to a more stable system. The fact that people have a real alternative will have a disciplining effect on existing banks, it will force banks to fund themselves more responsibly, and then they mean with more equity, capital, and long-term debt. Also, the creation of money and debt by commercial banks will be limited in, the, in this way. So this is the argument they put on the table. And of course, we use this argument also when we have discussions with politicians. So we should move into this direction. Um, and then, so since January, we were waiting uh, for the reaction of the government of the Netherlands. So what would they say about the report? Um, but the reaction was not there. And what the main problem is with this research council is that they don't answer the question how it should be implemented. So they say a safe alternative is needed, but they don't answer the question, is the central bank dig digital currency, is the public de deposit bank, is the private deficit bank, and how should it be implemented? So in the uh, last spring, this spring, we developed ourselves an easy to implement proposal, at least we think, and this is in a way also quite in line with what Ordonez is telling. So what we argue, we need a department under the Ministry of Finance and we call it the Public Deficit Institute. And the only thing that this institute does is giving accounts to people. These accounts give access to the central bank and you can open it in your private, uh, in your private payment service area. So you can open it in, in your commercial bank uh, payment environment, you can uh, open it in a fintech environment, you can open it in a payment envir environment of, of Amazon, but it gives indirectly access to the central bank. So we developed the, the, this proposal because the question how to implement was not, was not answered. 
Then we were, uh, last Tuesday, we were invited uh, at the Ministry of Finance to, for a meeting with the finance minister, uh, the chairman of the Foundation Full Reserve, uh, me, uh, Edgar Wortman, most of you know, the, our legal schooler, and, but also the theater, theater maker and two people of the Dutch Scientific Research Council to discuss the government reaction on, our, on the, uh, the report of the uh, Dutch Scientific Research Council and a proposal for a public deposit bank. The Minister of Finance, he was very friendly. We had a 45-minute chat. He said, yeah, you really made this a topic in the Netherlands, so we have a much better understanding of the current system. We have also a much better understanding of what is wrong with the current system, but we do not implement a public deposit bank. So the, 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 the official response of the government is, so the, gov the Dutch government currency ha currently has no plans to establish a public deposit bank because of the deposit, gar the deposit guarantee schemes. So they want to keep the opium of the banks. It welcomes private initiatives, but there's again the question, so when you establish a private de deficit bank, it will have limited chance because of GDS. And it is still not clear if all legal obstacles have been lifted. So even if you attempt it, it can still happen that you go to the Dutch Central Bank, they send you to the Ministry of Finance, and they say hey, politicians should, should change law, laws. So it's very complicated to find out who is responsible for what. And what the minister uh, said, so he will ask the Dutch Central Bank to research and start experiments with central bank digital currency, but according to him, and that's interesting, he argued in the end this is a choice of the Dutch Central Bank. So the question who is responsible for the implementation of a new kind of currency or a safe haven, it's really uh, vague in the Netherlands and maybe it's in, uh, in general in the Eurozone. That's a big problem. Then last Thursday, so the conference has a good timing because a lot of things are happening in the Netherlands. The, the lower house organized a second round table discussion. So they invited 16 experts for four hours. I was one of them. And we were asked also to give a reaction on the report of the Dutch Scientific Research Council, but also, of course, on the reaction of the government. And I was quite surprised that most experts, including two senior bankers, really senior bankers, they argue, uh, argued. So it is a question about the structure of the monetary financial system, about the design of the system, about the order of the system. So this is a political topic. And politicians are responsible for this ordering, for this structuring. Most of them also argue that the safe haven is a good idea, and for various reasons. And this is also interesting. So on the one hand, you can say that's customer freedom. You just have another asset that you can invest in. It's also more diversity, so if you want to have a more diverse financial sector, it's a good thing, but also for macroeconomic stability reasons. So it's a good thing, and it is an alternative for deposit guarantee schemes. That's also very important. And in the end, so quite including myself, we really said to politicians, it is about willingness. So it is about taking responsibility and the will to change something. So political, political action is, re is required according to most experts and experiments are needed. So we need to make steps and we, need, we do not need another round of research. That was the general consensus, I would say. So, so in this process, so last, so last five years, more or less five alternatives of safe havens emerged in the Netherlands. So we proposed digital cash, that's really a radical reform. Because in the end, that money is no longer a financial asset, it's just an asset. It's not an asset liability, but just an asset you have. So this is really a long-term reform. And if you look in the literature, the, in my view, there are only three people really promoting this. This is Onschelt in the Netherlands, uh, Macmillan of the end of banking, and Morgan Ricks in the money problem. They really argue that money sh should not or does not have to be a financial asset, so an asset liability. It can, it can be an asset in itself. So the second attempt, the private deposit bank, it is an interesting step or experiment, but in the Netherlands, at least, there are all the time legal obstacles, and also the deposit guarantee schemes is, of course, still very problematic. So if you do such a thing, you should also abolish stepwise the deposit insurance schemes. Central bank digital currency, the third variant, um, yeah, so I think it's a midterm reform. It's quite hard to implement, because then you have all kinds of questions with monetary policy and also different tasks and responsibility of the central bank. So what is needed are feasibility studies and experiments, I would say. 
We hebben een public deposit bank en de Save Accounts Public Deposit Institute that we developed ours, ourselves. These two, I think, are the most easy to implement. So we also asked the lawyer in the Netherlands to do some research, and according to her, these two are the, the, the most realistic ones. Because the government, this government has a kind of, uh, the, the, it does not have to the, the same laws as, as private institutions. So this is likely the way, way to go. And what I personally really like of our own proposal, so we have a quite clear separation between public and private. So the public part is, in this case, not the, the creation, but the registration of money. And the payment part, so really the, the, the payment apps and the payment uh, uh, the, the, yeah, the technology thing that you use for it can be private, so you have kind of competition there. And I think that's also quite in line with what Mr. Ordonez was telling. So thinking clearly about what should be public and what should be private, I think that's really essential. But again, so it's all about politi po political willingness, so politicians should take action. There is done a lot of research and people are uh, yeah, glad with it. Yeah, I'm already there, Klaus. Sorry. <laughs> so the conclusion. So there are many variants. Mm -hmm. So it's not that there's a lack of variants. And in my view, the main question is, do politicians take responsibility for the structure or the design of the monetary financial system in a digital age? That's a key question. And what we, so from my experience in the Netherlands, so nowadays the, and the understanding of the current system and the problems is much better than five years ago. So most politicians, at least in the Committee of Finance, do understand the work on, on, of, of the current system. They also know some of the disadvantages, and I think in particular in the Netherlands also debts are a problem, but also the instability of the payment system, of the monetary system. So the understanding is much higher, but then the question is how should it change? And, that's, and in particular in the euro area, I think it's a very difficult to say who's responsible for what. So this is, this is really a disadvantage of being in the euro area, because politicians all, always can hide about the European Parliament. They say it happens already in Brussels. It's a task of the European Central Bank, it's a task of the Dutch Central Bank. So this makes it very, very complicated. But from my experience, so I can tell, so there is a kind of movement and there is also a kind of progress in the general understanding so of the problems and the solutions. So after the summer in the Netherlands, it will be interesting. So there will be a debate in the lower house and the members of parliament can ask questions to the, to the um, Minister of Finance and can debate the, the, of the official government's reaction. And they can also put proposals for vote. So, for instance, there are two guys, one of the Social Liberal Party and one of the Socialist Party. I think they have a very good understanding of the system. They are raising the right question and they, are, they will put something for vote as a proposal. And then we don't know what happens. So I'm very curious after summer what will happen. And then uh, next time I, I can hopefully give an update on this. That something really changed. Thank you.